Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. Um, this is probably my last post for today. Um, came up with this list of 10 things that you may or may not know about psychology. Um, so I'll just dive right in. Number one, uh, construction cones. Uh, this is a little foam construction cone. Um, if you have a construction cone or you come across a construction cone on the sidewalk or the street, um, they actually cause you to um, notice your surroundings more so um, and become more aware of your surroundings. So I keep this little foam uh, construction cone that I got at the thrift store on my table here. A coffee table so that I'm more aware of my space and um, where everything is and kind of my uh, own way of organizing my space. Um, so that's number one thing that you might not have known about psychology. And I'm not sure why that works, but it's just something that I've learned um, kind of through experience over the years. Um, number two. <clears throat> number two is uh, if you keep books around, um, kind of within plain sight, um, they actually help you be more uh, productive when you're reading so keep like this is actually a false box but uh, I have some sunglasses in here right now but it looks like books so it should do the trick um, keep if you surround yourself with books or if you're trying to read uh, productively Go to a space like a library uh, where you're surrounded by books <clears throat> you'll find that uh, it becomes easier for you to focus and read and concentrate um, and be productive with your reading when you're surrounded by books uh, number three spirals um, i guess that this picture frame kind of has spirals on it um, spirals um, happen to have the effect on the brain of uh, causing it to keep going. Um, so my theory is that the uh, swastika, Nazi swastika, um, I don't even know if I can draw a swastika, but... Kind of looks something like that. Um, Nazi swastika was effective psychologically um, by causing people to keep going uh, because it resembles a spiral. Um, so the Nazi off, uh, officers who were doing all this brutality and slaughter of Jewish people or people who didn't have blonde hair, blue eyes, um, or whoever they were deciding to kill at that time. Um, my theory is that they're partially inspired by the swastika and its res resemblance of a spiral and the spiral psychological effect of um, motivating you to keep going. Um, number four, um, food images or thoughts. Let's see. Like, for example, if you keep a bag, this isn't why I have my bag of Cheetos here necessarily, but, um, kind of like cleaning up this table, but. Uh, 
um, if you keep a food object in front of you for people who have like anger management problems or anger issues, um, looking at food or thinking about food is kind of a, uh, it's kind of a distractor. Uh, so right. it takes your attention off of whatever's negative in the circumstance and, uh, My guess is it, it makes you think about food. I don't know exactly how it works, but um, for example, my case manager in his office at uh, Rose Hill Rehabilitation Center had this big uh, sticker, kind of like the size of this uh, on his desk of a cookie, chocolate chip cookie, and it was right here. And um, I think it really helped our relationship because I never got angry with him, at least until he took the cookie sticker off his desk when he left uh, for surgery. And um, when he came back, that cookie sticker wasn't there, but um, for some reason having a food distractor around um, kind of levels off your emotions or keeps you balanced um, and prevents you from getting frustrated or aggravated. Um, number five, flowers. Um, flowers, let's see if I can demonstrate this to you. This I, I actually discovered on my own. Um, I was trying to draw a fractal one day and uh, one of the repeating elements of a fractal is a seahorse or sea, yeah, seahorse. So I started drawing like a seahorse spirals and uh, I kind of just kept drawing and drawing and drawing like circles around itself like this. Kind of just like circles and circles and circles. And then kind of gets wider. And then I realized if you put a stem down and some thorns, it looks a hell of a lot like a flower or a rose. Um, and so for that same reason, flowers have the effect of motivating you to keep going and moving forward. Um, and I think that's why one way or another, um, when someone goes to the hospital or gets sick or uh, you're trying to encourage them to get healthy or get well, you send them flowers to the hospital. Um, they keep the flowers in their hospital bedroom it motivates them to keep going. Um, so uh, keep going with their recovery. So not only can it work in the negative way with the Nazi swastika, um, it can work in a positive way with um, sending flowers to your loved ones as they recover in the hospital. Um, or giving your girlfriend flowers on a special date or whatever. Um, and the other thing I learned from drawing this flower in an attempt to draw a fractal, and a fractal is, well, I'll let you guys look up what a fractal is if you don't know what it is, but, uh, so I was trying to draw a fractal and I came out with a flower. And I realized um, this is when I decided God is definitely real. There is a creator of the universe. And here's proof and an example of how he ended up drawing the form of a flower or a rose. Um, so 
So I decided and determined after doing this that God is actually a designer, an artist, the creator and sculptor of the world we live in and planet Earth. And perhaps he just hand drew us um, as he did, as I did this flower. Um, number six. Um, when it comes to recovery from mental illness, it's best that uh, you reject the diagnosis or de-identify with that diagnosis. Um, in an analogous situation, if you're diagnosed with cancer, instead of seeing yourself as a cancer patient, you would say, you know what, I don't have cancer, I'm cancer free. Um, I'm completely healthy. Or maybe I do have cancer, but I'm not a cancer patient. Um, or just refusing to accept that you have cancer. Um, however, with cancer, that may or may not work. Um, at least, and I, it probably does work too with cancer. It's probably beneficial to say, you know what, I got diagnosed with cancer, but I'm not going to identify as a cancer patient. I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not going to see myself as a victim of cancer. Um, I'm going to get healthy. And, um, same as analogous to doing that with mental illness. Um, I got diagnosed with schizophrenia and schizoaffective at this Rose Hill Rehabilitation Center after leaving Northwestern Hospital with the diagnosis of depression. And uh, I never once accepted that those diagnoses as being true or grounded in fact in any sh way, shape or form. Um, I knew that I didn't have them, or at least I, I was convinced and fully believed 100% that I did not have them. And by doing that, um, I was able to overcome them in 10 months entirely, um, if indeed I did ever have them. Uh, I'm now, after 10 months of rehabilitation and uh, applying my own uh, kind of attempts at curing myself, which the combination of the two worked. Um, I, I'm cured today. Um, and I can tell you about that. That's not what I'm trying to talk about right now, but what I would do if someone, if you're someone who's, for example, been diagnosed with depression is, um, uh, refuse to identify yourself as a a uh, person afflicted with the mental health, mental illness of major depressive disorder. Um, I have a psychiatrist right now who's really good. His name is <clears throat> Dr. Goldman in Chicago. And I've met with him twice over uh, Zoom. And, excuse me. Um, he... This was part of my terms and conditions of uh, being invited to live with my parents back in Winneka that I see this psychiatrist and he refuses to give me any diagnosis at all, um, except to say that I don't have schizophrenia and I don't have schizoaffective. Um, and he thought about actually, he, he said probably the closest diagnosis that I would have as of now would be bipolar. Um, but that I don't have bipolar and he's simply trying to treat, treat, uh, give me treatment in ways that will be beneficial to me. So I think it's an incredibly genius way of treating someone. It's the way that I've been treating myself. Um, 
by refusing to accept these labels. And I appreciate that he's not putting labels on me. Um, and as a matter of fact, I know I don't have bipolar. And I know that even if he wanted to diagnose me with bipolar, um, according to the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, DSM, uh, I think it's still DSM-4, um, you can't diagnose someone who has been taking um, stimulants for ADD in the past two years, year or two, uh, with bipolar. Um, so, um, as of now, I am entirely healed. Um, and I'll just quickly tell you that the other thing um, he told me was that uh, there's that basically I, I he's confident that I'll be able to get off and I won't tell you if I'm on them or off them uh, but he's confident that one day he won't have to prescribe me with um, an antipsychotic which is called Abilify and a mood stabilizer which is called Lamictal or Lamotrigine. He says that um, he's confident there will be uh, he's confident that I'll be able to stop these medications uh, shortly and um, I won't tell you whether or not I'm on them uh, currently or whether I'm taking them however they are being prescribed um, but I will tell you that I'm uh, 100% healed of any mental illness except potentially uh, attention deficit disorder um, which leads me into my number seven thing that you might not know about psychology which is that mental illness can be overcome. I've done it with um, five diagnosed mental illnesses and um, one more, or no, four diagnosed mental illnesses and two undiagnosed mental illnesses um, that I've been cured of. And so anyone who tells you that uh, these things are permanent. It's definitely not true and uh, don't lose hope Number eight um, I want to talk quickly on the ego and what that is um, This is kind of a new term to me that I've been reading about in uh, Some of my books Diane and I went through a streak of uh, Reading For a month and a half that eventually turned into uh, watching movies for another month and a half or so, or maybe a month or a couple weeks. Um, but for the first month and a half, we were reading every day, like all day. And we read 15 books in a month and a half, which comes out to like a book every single three, or uh, finishing one book every three days. And uh, several of these books talk about the ego. So the ego is, what the ego is, is um, it's an identification with the mind and it's an identification with your thoughts. Um, and the problem is that um, to spiritual masters and people who have found enlightenment, people who have experienced transcendence spiritually. Uh, the mind and your thoughts are actually, when you ask the question, who am I? Uh, the answer to that question is most definitely not your thoughts and most definitely not your mind. Um, so, uh, and if you think about it, 
Um, the reason you know that you're not your thoughts, at least, is that when you sit down and you start listening to your thoughts, um, for example, I could be watching a movie, movie with my family and in my head, I'm thinking the whole time, like, I wish I wasn't watching the movie. This movie sucks. Like, um, I really want to be reading a book right now or um, I wish I had a beer or just like all that endless chatter that's going on in your head. You know that's not you. And the reason you know that's not you is because you can hear it. You can hear yourself talking in your head or you can hear the thoughts going through your head. So if you were the person speaking those thoughts, A, um, well then the question is, who is the person behind the thoughts who's observing and witnessing those thoughts? Um, and the answer is that's your, that's your true self. Your true self is the person who watches thoughts, um, witnesses thoughts, watches your emotions, watches your physical, uh, physical body. Um, and this is what they call your soul or your spirit. Um, and according to these spiritual masters, the ego is the source of all your suffering. Um, if you think about it, most of our thoughts are useless. Most of our thoughts are um, complaints. Most of our thoughts are negative, at least in some circumstances. Um, to the untrained mind or uh, even to the trained mind, they can be. Uh, that having all these thoughts doesn't really help us and it actually causes suffering when half or more of them are negative. Um, and so when you de-identify with these thoughts, you kind of, um, you lose the ego or your sense of self that's rooted in, you know, how good you look, um, how intelligent you are, um, what you've accomplished in your past, this and that. Um, the ego can also be finding a sense of self or an identification with your physical body. Um, which these spiritual masters say is also not part of your true self, your inner being. Um, and I agree. I've, you'll come to find that if you think and look deeply enough into it. Um, and then the other part of ego is your emotions, which manifest through your body. Um, so you have the thoughts, the mind, Thoughts in the mind is one part of your ego, and then your physical body and your emotions as the other manifestation of your ego. And when we, when we uh, disidentify, de-identify, or distance ourselves, refuse, refuse to um, find our sense of self in these four things, mind, body, thoughts, and emotions. That's what we call uh, getting rid of our ego and becoming present and centered and aware of ourselves and conscious. And this process of stripping away the ego and becoming a conscious present, um, conscious and present as a human being and as who I really am, who that person really is. Um, this is what we call transcendence or enlightenment. 
And since the ego causes so much suffering in even just in yourself, um, and because suffering begets suffering, uh, and when you cause suffering to yourself and you cause suffering to others, this creates all the bad things in, in life, um, such as war, conflict, um, it can lead to divorce. Um, one of the reasons the Chicago Bulls of the 90s uh, considered such a high level team was because um, they were able to let go, the superstars on that team were able to let go of their ego, distance themselves from their ego. And um, this allowed people like Scottie Pippen and, and Dennis Rodman, who hated each other, um, to coexist on the same team and perform at the highest level. Um, this allowed people like Michael Jordan to pass it to people like Steve Kerr to make the final three-point shot to win the game. Um, this is what brings people together. This is what promotes love in this world. This is what um, removes suffering and promotes joy. And uh, this is what will bring world peace to this planet. Um, removing ourselves of ego and choosing not to seek a sense of self in our mind, body, physical body, our physical mind, our thoughts, or our emotions. Instead, recognize the inner being that we are, which is why Eckhart Tolle says it's it's fitting that we're called human beings um, because there's the human part, which is the mind, the physical mind, the physical body, the thoughts and the emotions that correspond to each. And there's the being part, which is underneath all of that. And that's our true essence, our true essential self. If we all can transcend the mind and the body and recognize ourselves as the being behind and uh, above all of this, then um, you'll live a happier life. You'll live in the present. I promise you, your whole life will change. Um, You'll be rid of fear. You'll be rid of uh, anxiety. You'll be rid of virtually every negative emotion. Um, and and this will be an end to the source of what we call all, what we call the source of all evil in this planet. The source of all evil in this planet is not evil people, but people who are living unconsciously people who are living from the ego people who haven't stripped their ego and found their true identity which is the soul which is the inner being or the spirit and once you find the spirit the spirit is continually present in the present moment the spirit is happy the spirit is love and joy and all the positive things. So, um, this is what I had to say about the ego, and this is what the spiritual masters are preaching that um, is the next step in human evolution, um, which is a shift in consciousness from unconscious ego-based living, which causes war, violence, conflict, um, to a state of enlightenment um, or presence or um, consciousness 
that uh, comes from a place of love, pure love. Um, and this is what some people talk about when they say there's there's a, a, a God inside all of us. Um, that God is called love. And um, when you strip yourself of that ego and you become president in the moment, this is when you tap into that inner god or goddess that lives inside of you. Um, number nine. Um, while our thoughts are something that we should distance ourselves from, um, We still all have thoughts, even Buddhist monks, Zen monks. Um, this, some people think that uh, this probably is a misconception that part of meditation is to still the mind, which is true. And to, but not to entirely rid yourself of thought, which is what some people think. Um, everyone has thoughts excuse me, and uh, this kind of the, the human part of you, which has thoughts, or the human side, as opposed to the, the human being, or the being itself, the inner being, um, we experience thoughts, and there's a mind-body connection. And it turns out that um, healthy and happy thoughts and pure thoughts um, reflect itself in a healthy, um, well-nourished body. So the conclusion here, the the implication here is that if you are able to alter your thoughts and purify your thoughts, this is the gateway to um, recovery, both mentally and physically. Um, and one of the ways that we can alter our thoughts, one of the things that causes or creates thoughts is um, what we read or what we see on TV, or what we hear on the radio, or what we, the lyrics of a song, or um, you know, thoughts arise out of what you surround yourself with. So if you surround yourself with uh, great books, with great words, and you spend your time reading great books with great words, um, if you listen to positive music with positive lyrics, if you watch shows on TV that aren't, um, you know, nonviolent or, um, you know, have a positive, carry a positive message, um, these will influence your thoughts and generate more pure, more happy, um, more healthy thoughts than would, um, than would surround yourself with negativity and, uh, you know, negative influences, books about, um, war, I guess there are some books about war that uh, where the moral of the story is that war is bad, but like um, if you're reading a book about war and there's it's full of swear words, if, if it's full of violence, um, if you're watching TV and it's just... Um, 
for example, if all you're watching is the coronavirus news and all they're talking about is death and sickness and um, how many murders there were in the past week and um, this and that, these are going to, you're going to have, you're still going to have thoughts, but these, the thoughts that will arise are uh, less healthy. And so in this way where we are in control of our thoughts, you, it, it's not that huge of a mystery where our thoughts come from. There is a percentage of thoughts that appear spontaneous, but most of them are um, prompted by things in our surroundings. So, um, if you find yourself, if you find your body ailing, um, consider if your mind is ailing, or if your if your mind is ailing, consider if your body is ailing, and uh, recognize there's this mind-body connection. Um, there's something called, um, what's the word? One second. Um, Uh, there's a word called, I can't think of the word actually, but, um, painful thoughts can even cause you to feel pain physically. Like if you're watching someone get beat up, you might actually feel pain inside yourself, you know, um, there, your thoughts can manifest physically too. And this is what I'm trying to get at. Um, healthy thoughts lead to healthy body. Healthy mind leads to a healthy body. Um, and purity of thought will bring you lots of joy in your life. Um, number 10. Uh, number 10 is the attributes you most commonly associate with your, as being functions of the brain. Um, are most effectively viewed as plastic. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say is things like intelligence or IQ, um, personality traits, charisma, warmth, introversion, extroversion, drive, you know, the list goes on and on of things that, um, we attribute as being derived from the, the brain. Um, it's best to view these things as uh, skills or plastic, things that are, are um, not static, but instead um, dynamic and changing. So when you define these things as skills, like if you define charisma as a skill, um, as a skill, skills are inherently uh, things that we can improve, we can strengthen and develop um, as opposed to something that you're being born with and that's fixed for the rest of your life. Um, we know that intelligence or IQ can go up. Um, and uh, things like personality traits or charisma or warmth, um, these are all things, anything that you consider to be a product of the brain we know that the brain is plastic and um, what that means is the way you use your brain every day re constantly is rewiring your brain um, 
and um, if you work on a certain aspect of your brain enough, these neural pathways will strengthen and uh, you will actually develop skills such as uh, analogous to the skill of being able to ride a bike or the skill of drawing. Um, these are all skills that you can practice, that you can get better at, that you can develop. Um, we can improve, we can increase our abilities in. And this is called the growth mentality. And the, the opposite of the growth mentality is the fixed static mentality. And as long as you assume a growth mentality, um, your brain will, and even if you don't, your brain is always changing, your brain will grow, um, your brain will strengthen in the areas that you work to improve. So those are 10 things you didn't know about psychology. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I, I may or may not post another video today, but uh, I will be definitely posting one tomorrow. Um, I enjoyed sharing with this with you guys. Um, this is 10 things you may or may not have known about psychology. And uh, this is just the first 10 things that came to mind. So if I, th uh, if I think of more things that might be of interest to you, I will write them down, add to this list, and post another video. Because um, I know that, or at least to me, this is pretty interesting stuff um, that could help out a lot of people. Um, and some of it's just fun facts, too. So, um, like, who knew that traffic cones, keeping this foam traffic cone around can increase my awareness and my um, awareness of my surroundings just by keeping it on my desk. Um, so 10 fun facts, 10, th 10 things you may or may not know about psychology. There's the cool thing about the field of psychology is there's so much that we don't know there's so much, um, and things that we think we know now, we, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years down the line, surely 100 years down the line, are going to come across a whole lot of things that we think we know now that are completely wrong. And uh, on top of that, there's so much that we know we don't know about the brain, about psychology. About the mind um that is a huge mystery and uh it's an exciting topic to be involved in and be exploring so, thanks again